I'm here with Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of the Durant Alexander. Let's talk about uh, a raid by Kosovo Special Forces. They raided the town of Zubin Patok, and they, uh, they took it to custody. 23 uh, people. Uh, those include uh, Serbians, and they also include a Russian uh, UN diplomat. And now this is actually a, a pretty tense situation because uh, the Serbian president, uh, Vucic, actually said that the, the, the military is, is on high alert and uh, that Serbia will do whatever it takes to protect those people that have been uh, taken into custody by the Kosovo Special Forces. They're known as the ROSU. Now, the Special Forces said that they were raiding this uh, this town because there was, quote, unquote, organized crime network in the area. Alexander, uh, Kosovo is um, a flashpoint uh, place of uh, of tension in in Europe. Our users are I'm, I'm sure our, our, our viewers are very familiar with uh, with the region, with the Balkans, with the war. That took place that broke up Yugoslavia. What's what's going on here? Well, I think this is an extremely tense situation, and one has to wonder what exactly has provoked it. Now, let us be very clear about this. There is an actual agreement. There was a ceasefire agreement uh, between the Serb uh, uh, the Serb government and the Kosovars, and uh, this basically said that Kosovo special forces could not operate so deep in Serb um, in Serb territory. Now, this is territory within Kosovo, the uh, within the former Yugoslav uh, uh, province or, or Republic of Kosovo, which used to be an integral part of Serbia, which was in turn an integral part of the Yugoslav Federation. Now, um, before the war of 1999, there was a large Serbian community in Kosovo. Many of those people have left or been driven out. But there is this enclave around the town of Mitrovica in uh, uh, Kosovo, which is still Serb. And, we're, uh, uh, and in that town and in the area around about, Serbs live. And this particular raid took place deep in that territory, this Serb territory within Kosovo over which the uh, um, um, Kosovo government in Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, which is an Albanian-speaking government, has no actual jurisdiction. So uh, this is an extraordinary provocation because, as I said, they have uh, launched this strike deep into Serb territory, um, um, reopening what is for the Serbs a very raw wound because, of course, Serbs regard Kosovo as a province of Serbia, which has been illegally taken from them and where NATO troops are stationed and which they consider to be occupied territory. They've also had very, very strong feelings, antagonistic feelings about the Kosovo uh, government, which they see as a creation of the NATO powers and which they have also in turn accused of engaging in war crimes and of criminal activity. So this strike by uh, 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 the Kosovo special forces into Serb territory is almost calculated, it seems to me, to raise tensions at this time. And the fact that they rounded it up and took away these people and included amongst them a Russian diplomat or uh, a Russian official with diplomatic st status, uh, um, um, you know, uh, is a major escalation and also a major provocation. Now, both the Russians have and the Serbs have vigorously complained. President Vucic, as you correctly say, has now uh, placed the Serbian military on high alert. He's made it very clear that if there's any further military strikes, on this uh, Serb territory within Kosovo. The Serb military itself will respond and um, he's getting very strong diplomatic support from Russia, which could hardly not provide support, precisely because Serbia is Russia's big ally in the Balkans and also 
because from the uh, Russian point of view, one of their officials has been taken. So the big question is, why now? Why has this happened now? And the Russian foreign ministry has uh, published a statement in which essentially they are blaming the chief sponsor and protector of uh, uh, Kosovo, of the Kosovo government in Pristina, which is, of course, the United States. And this is happening at a very, very tense time in the Balkans with uh, um, the uh, Russians planning to build pipelines across the Balkans with a contested referendum about changing the name of the country in uh, uh, the former Yugoslav Mas Republic of Macedonia, which has now had its name changed to Northern Macedonia, where there's been tensions in Montenegro, which has also had a long history of close relations with uh, Russia, where there have been tensions in Bosnia. And there is a suspicion, I think, amongst the Russians that this is the United States trying to create problems in this part of the world as part of some kind of policy of destabilization. Um, whether that's right or not, we shall see. But it is interesting that it's happened now. Well, I, I, I can't believe that, uh, you know, a, a, any type of special forces or government, a so-called government in Kosovo, um, is acting on its own accord. I mean, that, that I just cannot believe. I mean, it is essentially mm -hmm. Kosovo. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Kosovo is essentially just a NATO statelet, is it not? I mean, the, 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 the thing that is there is NATO. That's it. I mean, that's what it's specifically there to do is to have a NATO presence, bam, in the smack in the center of the Balkans. It's a NATO protectorate. There's a huge American military base there. And, of course, it's, it's the largest U.S. military base, I believe, in this part of the world. So this is for the Serbs and for the Russians, an object of huge concern. There is, it's a, it must be said, a, a Kosovo dimension to all of this, because the president of Kosovo, or uh, uh, Mr. Thaci, has been recently speaking about Kosovo uniting with Albania, uh, um, the people in Kosovo are Albanian speaking. And uh, um, and this, of course, is regarded by many people in Serbia as a major provocation. But it's also part of the nationalist Albanian drive, which has been ongoing in this part of the Balkans for some time. And of course, it's probably not coincidental that it's happening at a time when there's been economic problems in Kosovo as well. So um, there may be there may be an internal Kosovo dimension, but I entirely agree with you. I mean, it is inconceivable that a strike of this kind could have happened without, at the very least, a green light from the US and probably some more some some encouragement beyond that. All right, so they've uh, detained the Russian diplomat who's in the UN mis mission in Kosovo. The UNMIK is what that mission uh, goes by. Yes. The diplomat is Mikhail Krasnochekov. And uh, Maria Sakharova issued this statement, Alexander, and I quote, the detention took place in defiance of the Russian's diplomatic immunity of a UN official. We regard this out outrageous act as another manifestation of provocative policies by the Kosovo Albanians' top brass. We demand that the UNMIK's leadership provide exhaustive information regarding the illegal arrest of Mikhail Krasnochekov and do its utmost for his immediate release. What do you make of that statement by Well, Sakharova? I mean, it's, it's a very strong statement about, and I'm sure the Russians will get this man released. I mean, he does have diplomatic status. His arrest was a massive breach of international law. I, I don't think that the US and the Kosovars will keep him in detention for very long. Having said that, I'm going to make a further point. Here we have a Russian diplomat arrested on the territory of a European country, seized in a raid, held in detention. And where are the comments about it? Where are the protests? Um, this is, as I said, a major breach of international law. Um, it is an act of war to seize a diplomat in that way. Um, but th the Western powers collectively are completely silent about this. I think ultimately he will be released. 
Um, but um, the Russians are clearly drawing their own conclusions. Now, what do you make of uh, President uh, Vucic's statement? Um, mm. He has issued a, a fairly strong statement. He he hasn't been in the past. I don't think he's been viewed as a as a very strong leader for Serbia. No. And he has uh, come under a lot of criticism for being very pro-EU. Some yes. even said that he's even pro-NATO at times. Um, what do you make of his statement now coming out and saying, one, putting the, the military on high alert, and then coming out and saying that, that, they, that Serbia will do whatever it takes to obtain the release of these 20, 22 individuals, let's say, if you disclude yes. the... The Russian ambassador, the, the Russian right, well, 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 Russia just played an extremely complicated, and some would say, as some Serbian people no doubt would say, a treacherous great game, because he was elected to power as a Serb nationalist or Serb patriot, and at the same time as being elected in that capacity, has pursued a policy of rapprochement with the Western powers, with the EU and with NATO, which, of course, many Serbian people have never forgiven for the war that was waged against Yugoslavia, in other words, against Serbia, in 1999, and for the bombing of Belgrade, and for the separation of Kosovo from Serbia. But he's done this, he's balanced this, by trying to make, also maintain very, very close relations with Russia. And he's known to be personally close to Russian President Putin. I think that he doesn't want an escalation of the situation. I think he does want an improvement of relations with the Western powers. At the same time, precisely because he knows that so many Serbs are suspicious of him, and precisely also because the government which he leads is suspected by many Serbs of being corrupt. He has, does not have a fully stable position within Serbia itself. So he has to take a strong line to withstand this thing, because if he doesn't, he risks his own position in Serbia becoming compromised. Having said that, I also have to say that despite all these very strong no noises that have been coming out of Vucic, he has also been saying that Serbia will do e everything it possibly can to avoid an armed conflict. So he's talking, as he always does, uh, um, out of one side of his mouth in That's one way and at the other side in a different way. And I think this is something that aggravates many people in Serbia intensely. Do you think this eventually will get resolved, Alexander, and uh, it will just go back to the status quo for Kosovo? Because Kosovo is not recognized by by mm. all the, the countries in the international community either. It is a disputed territory. Um, at least its legitimacy is disputed, and, and rightly so. Um, are we just going to go back to the status quo, or are things going to get worse? No, I think they're going to get worse, not perhaps immediately. I think this particular, this particular uh, spat might be uh, resolved, but we need to be very, very clear that the whole situation in this part of the Balkans, not just in Kosovo, is unsustainable in the long term. As I've said many times, what, what NATO policy has achieved since the Yugoslav Wars of the, of the 1990s, is to surround Serbia, a very angry and aggrieved Serbia, with a collection of microstates, unstable microstates, Kosovo, Montenegro, Bosnia, uh, um, uh, and Macedonia, as I suppose you must now call it, against all of which, Serbia has both grievances and claims. And all of these territories in one way or one form or another are, are antagonistic to uh, um, um, Serbia, perhaps Northern Macedonia much less so, but nonetheless, overall, they, you know, there, there is this tension. And of course, into this explosive mix already, there is the uh, problem of Albanian nationalism with many Albanians talking about, uh, uh, well, some Albanians talking about establishing a greater Albania, which will include Kosovo, include territories of what is now Serbia, 
include half of Macedonia and parts of northern Greece. So this is a completely unsustainable situation. And the United States taking these steps, because as I say, I think we're both in agreement that this raid could not have happened without the agreement of the United States, with the United States playing with fire all the time, keeping this situation unstable, sooner or later, probably later for the moment, rather than sooner, it is going to explode. And we're going to see more wars in this part of the Balkans with unpredictable consequences and great dangers uh, given the great superpower interests in this air, in this region with the United States, Russia, both involved and both very concerned about it, as we saw with the Russian diplomat being taken prisoner and with other powers like uh, 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 Germany and Turkey also interested as well. So this is a very, very volatile part of the world, a very unstable part of the world. And sooner or later, it is inevitable that there will be a smash. Yeah, it's that instability that the that the U.S. preys upon, and it holds yes. it and, yes. and it holds it over the head of of Europe. I mean, Europe plays along, obviously. Let's Absolutely. not forget Germany was a big a big player in making sure that Yugoslavia was broken apart. Germany Absolutely. played, if not the most active role outside of the United yes. States, to make sure that Yugoslavia was broken up. But right now, the U.S prefers to keep this part of the world in in a little bit of limbo, so to speak, yes. because like you said, you have Turkey, you have Russia, they're tightening the noose around, uh, you know, Serbia's neck. Serbia will never succumb. I, I don't no. think Serbia will ever succumb to NATO. No. You know, they'll resist yes. all the way until the, until the bitter end. But the U.S. is definitely, I think, keeping it very tense. Yes. It is keeping it very tense, but also I have to say this, and this is always the problem with U.S. diplomacy. I, I think that there is this hasn't again been thought through, because does the U.S. really want another confrontation with Russia in the Balkans this time? I mean, they, they, they've got themselves locked up in confrontations in Ukraine, in Venezuela, in Iran in all, Syria, in all sorts of places, none of these are going especially well. Do they really want to get themselves mixed up in the Balkans also? I wonder about that. I, I'm going to just add one other little thing, that of course from, from the position of some NATO geostrategists, and there's been a most remarkable document that was produced by the Rand Corporation recently, which is this extraordinary, very powerful U.S. semi-government think tank, which uh, proposes various policies. You, the, the, there's been a great deal of talk about destabilizing and overextending Russia. And um, this may be part of that. It may also be part of the game of trying to separate Russia from Turkey, because, of course, Turkey has historically always been sympathetic to the Albanians, both in Kosovo and in Albania. And uh, Erdogan, who's the president of Turkey, has stood out at times as the protector of these people. So it could be that this is the sort of longer game that's being played. But it's a very reckless and foolish game. And it's one which, it seems to me, doesn't fully understand the strength of the forces potentially in the Balkans, which are being played with. I mean, we both saw the protests in Greece against the change of uh, Macedonia's name. Um, those would be dwarfed by the feelings people would feel in Greece if there was another war of this sort in the Balkans. And not just in Greece, in Bulgaria, in Macedonia, in Romania also. I mean, this could set the Balkans on fire in a way that might not work out in the U.S. interests. And playing this game of this strategy of tension, if you like, in the Balkans could very easily spiral out of control and backfire badly on the U.S. Yeah, well, they, <laughs> the U.S. foreign policy, I don't think, ever thinks that far ahead. That's for sure. But, well, this but, but I mean, the, the philosophy has always been in the past. 
mm-hmm. least in my understanding, is that if you can strike at Serbia, then you can deliver a fatal blow to Russia. I mean, I think that's always been, you know, they've always, you know, seen Serbia and Russia as, you know, kind of part yes. and parcel. Well, yes, I, I, I understand that. But as I said, it's, if I may say so, they ought to think these things through. And as uh, to be to be very, very clear, Russians care about Serbia in ways that they don't care. I'm talking about, you know, Russian people, not just the Kremlin, uh, in ways that they don't care about, say, Syria or Venezuela. Venice, Ru- Serbia is a country that's very close to Russia for very, very strong reasons. And I have to say that um, one of the reasons why uh, Russian opinion turns so strongly against the United States and against the West in the late 1990s was because of the Yugoslav war. And repeating all that again is going to anger Russia even more (laughs) at a time when relations between the US and Russia are very bad already. And at a time when some people in the US are admittedly on the uh, Trumpian right have been talking of trying to detach Russia from China, which is now being set up as the US's great geopolitical adversary. So, I mean, you know, one wonders who exactly is thinking up these things. Uh, I, you know, it, I, 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 I can think of I can think of two names. <laughs> well, I can think of obviously Bol- Bolton and Pompeo. Right. I suspect lots of other people too. I don't, I don't think Bolton's that smart for this. I, this this smells no. of I mean, Bolton Pompeo. This smells very much of like a Bolton Bolton esque type of yes. strategy. Well, it may be, but I mean, as I said, it, it, in the end, it, it, like a lot of these strategies that you know, I mean, that Bolton has uh, been involved himself in, if it really is Bolton, I nothing ever works. It, it all goes wrong. And I need to say something else. I mean, I think in the 1990s, uh, early 1990s, when Germany was at its the peak of its power and self-confidence, there'd just been German unification, uh, all sorts of people in Germany were thinking, you know, that Germany was going to move forward and advance in all sorts of ways. At that time, Obviously, there were people in Germany who were very keen on breaking up Yugoslavia and who thought that Germany could play a big role there. I'm not so sure that's true now, actually. I think that the very last thing some people in Germany want is another crisis in Europe, in the Balkans, with a potential to destabilize an EU that is already in a very bad way. But there we are. I mean, you know, this seems to be, as is so often the case now, an unstoppable train. Yeah. And in Greece, uh, you know, Serbia also has a very special relationship with Greece as well. So the Greeks would would come down very much on the side of of Serbia should something break. And I also think you kind of miscalculate on Turkey's uh, where Turkey will come down, even though you are you're exactly right that Erdogan has positioned himself in the past as the, the protector of Albania. I think with the gas pipelines and, and, and the Turk Stream South Stream, I think Erdogan would probably also say, you know what? Gas and energy trumps Albania's, oh, uh, uh, <laughs> Albania's well-being. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't miscalculate. <laughs> I agree. I, I absolutely agree, actually. I, I think Erdogan would not go down that route. I think that, uh, as he has repeatedly shown in the past, he may pose as the defender at various times of various people, but I don't think he's going to translate that into any effective action. The problem is there may be some people in Washington who are miscalculating on that, uh, and that would be another in a long list of miscalculations which we have seen. Anyway, let's let's hope, as I said, that calmer, calmer minds, cooler heads prevail, at least at the moment. But I come back to what I have said. Sooner or later, this thing is going to break down because the situation in this part of the Balkans is unsustainable. It cannot p- continue like this indefinitely. There will have to be a resolution of this uh, crisis this festering crisis in the Balkans. Um, I, 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 and that may be of a sort that many people, not just in Washington, but in Brussels 
and Paris and London and Berlin won't like. Well, you have to solve the Kosovo issue, which I think is have- absolutely unsolvable as as long as you have a massive NATO base there. And, and something we didn't mention is that Kosovo also holds a, a very uh, deep historical significance for Serbs. Uh, for Serbs. I mean, it, it is yeah. it is perhaps the most important absolutely um, it, uh, and, and, and territory and for Serbia in a historical context. Absolutely. And as we both know, in, in this part of the world, people don't forget those things. And why should they, by the way? But no, I, I, absolutely. But I mean, you can't, I mean, any any stable settlement of the Balkans has to resolve the issue of, of, of Kosovo in a way that understands and takes into account and satisfies those very deep, uh, and, and legitimate uh, concerns, but it isn't just Kosovo. I mean, we have to look at Bosnia. We have to look at so yeah, Ma- northern Macedonia, as we must now call it. We must look at Montenegro also, and we have to really start thinking about whether establishing and sustaining these micro states is really the way forward. Well, it clearly isn't. We, you know, maybe some kind of federal or confederal structure c- can be recreated. I'm, I'm not here to propose solutions. All I am saying is that this is not a sustainable situation in the long term. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as long as, because in order to solve it, and, and we'll probably end on this, I want your thoughts, in order, order to solve it, instead of NATO advancing, which is what you're seeing, yeah. You know, you, you, all, all these statelets are now jumping on the NATO train, North Macedonia being next, you know. Yes. It was uh, fast-tracked now to become yes. a NATO member. God yes. knows why. What does NATO need North Macedonia for? But instead of getting NATO out of there, it seems that oh, the only thing that's happening is that you're pushing NATO more into this area. Well, indeed. Indeed, that's exactly what the policy is. You it can't solve done. it with NATO there. It's no, <laughs> NATO course, smack no, you can't. there. Hey. You're making the situation worse. But the reason it's being done is 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 twofold. Firstly, to contain Serbia, because, of course, uh, it, it is Serbia that is seen as the ultimate challenge to, uh, uh, um, the, you know, the Western hegemony in this region and to put more pressure on Serbia. And the other is to lock all these states in order to close down or close down the, the prospect of Russian pipeline projects. Yeah. But of course, uh, it doesn't really work because Bulgaria, for example, which is a, uh, a NATO member state and an EU member state, um, is now uh, uh, tilting increasingly back towards Russia, with Bulga- which Bulgarians have historically and traditionally always considered to be a friendly country to Bulgaria. It's the country which liberated Bulgaria from the Ottomans. And they're all, they're they are now actively also considering building all of these pipelines. In fact, that is the policy as I understand it in Bulgaria now. So you you can't really win this struggle and, and it's pointless trying and it's unnecessary to try because if pipelines are built, they're not going to threaten the United States. But all these attempts are destabilizing the Balkans and they're creating conditions for the kind of provocations which we which we have just seen in Kosovo. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. Alexander Mercurius, editor-in-chief of the Durand. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Click on that notifications bell to make sure you get notifications every time we push out a new video. And visit the Durad shop to pick up a t-shirt like the one that I am wearing today. Or you can pick up a Durad mug like the one that Alexander is holding in his right hand. That is the Durad mug. How do you like that mug, Alexander? It is a marvelous mug. It is beautifully made. It's solid. It's strong. It's comfortable to hold. It has a big capacity. You can drink tea out of it, as I do. Or you can drink coffee. It's marvelous for coffee. Or you could even drink beer from it, which is it's certainly big enough. Beer, for that. whiskey, 
whiskey, Vodka, whatever. Milkshake, very, smoothie, whatever. Milkshake, whatever you like. You whatever you like. <laughs> Hot chocolate, which is, I haven't done that, but I bet it would be great for that too. All right, it's, so. it's, it's a fantastic mug. And can I also say, because I'm, I'm the proud owner of one of these uh, shirts that Alex was talking about, a beautiful polo shirt, um, and I've worn it on some of our programs. Uh, it's in the wash at the moment, but there's more coming. It, they're mag- it's a magnificent shirt, 100% com- uh, cotton, beautifully embroidered, immensely comfortable to wear. You just sense the quality when it's on you, and it looks great. So uh, please help us by buying them. Help yourself by owning one. Well said. Well said, Alexander. <laughs> and guys, you can also donate to us on uh, PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribe Star as well. So the links are in the description box down below. And you can also follow us on Instagram, the Duran underscore com. Go to our website, the Duran.com and see the articles that Alexander is linking up to. And Alexander, before I forget, we also have an ebook on the Duran shop, which you can pick up. The ebook covers the three months up until the uh, EU parliament vote for Brexit. It chronicles the videos that we did from May's three failed attempts to get her withdrawal agreement passed all the way up to the rise of Farage. Alexander, you wrote the forward to that ebook. Yes. And can I just say, if you want to get a, an idea, and I think most people would agree that we've dissected what happened in Britain and predicted it incredibly well. And in fact, in my forward, I point out how prescient our uh, analysis of the whole Brexit crisis in Britain has turned out to be and how we anticipated the rise of the Brexit party and of Farage from a very, very early stage. Um, If you want to see it all and read it and get a sense of how this crisis in Britain, formerly the most stable of Western states, um, how this crisis has arisen, um, go to that book. It's all explained there. It's all, I think, very clearly set out, as we've discussed it in our videos. Uh, Alex and I, over many uh, weeks and months, as we follow the story so closely. Yes, and if you are a Patreon or on Subscribestar, we have that ebook available for you. Otherwise, it's only for four dollars and ninety-nine cents. So, a cup of coffee gets you a forty-four page ebook, a great read. So, and it helps. So. Uh, it helps keep this keep this channel going. So I encourage you to check that out at the Duran shop. The link is also in the description box down below. Alexander McCurry, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.